Welcome legends and heli heads and choppers and stick bangers to update three of the Bell 222 Scal Fuselage build, otherwise known as Bella. Now, in update one, we covered building the fuselage. Update two was about lighting and cabling and routing and general sort of housekeeping of all those blasted cables. And this update, update three, is the final bit of the story with regards to the retracks. Uh, if you haven't seen that video that I've done in between update one and update two, you can see it up there. But uh, if you follow that video, then you'll ultimately, <laughs> you'll ultimately save yourself a whole world of skull crushing hurt, care of, Jack fun key. Ah! progress since the last update, update two. In this update, as I said in the intro there, we're going to be covering the retracks and I'll show you what they look like. But I'll also give you a heads up on other things that have completed over the past week, particularly a recent weekend where I gave up flying to pretty much live in the heli shed and with Bella for 48 hours. Pretty much straight um, to get to where we are now. It is ironic um, that um, a scale fuselage build, whether that's a scale fuselage or whether that's a super scale, is a labour of love. It does take over your life and you do get to a point where you just want it done. I just want it completed. <laughs> I want to fly it. And that's it. So uh, this video, we're going to be covering all those other areas that I've done. You can see there that with the landing gear that all three come up and go down at the same time. Sadly, with a serverless retract, you can't control the speed, but in my view, the speed that we're seeing here is perfectly good enough. Remember that with the landing gear with the Bell 222, that the knee goes forward. And as we see when we turn Bella over, these are specific types of landing gear that I was looking for, which was with a spar either side of the wheel. The Olio strut offers an element of suspension and when you've got a helicopter that weighs nearly nine kilos, you're going to need that. These particular landing gear are good enough. You could go down the realms of putting in a stronger spring, particularly for the main landing gears here, but there really is no need. You'll note that the pin you can't see on the front landing gear, but on the main landing gear you can the pin is exposed and because I haven't got a sleeve to go over the pin I've just used nuts here to give a bit of a cover um, over the pin. Um, you know, that's thinking outside the box at the end of the day. It works, it looks fine and you know I'm not going to get excited about it and that's the most important thing. Right, let's turn her over and have a look. Looking at the nose on the underside of Bella now we can see the serverless retract in there and very clearly the pin which goes from the serverless retract block into the landing gear. The pin is 39 millimeters and it needs to be millimeter perfect in order that when the oleo strut comes into the housing that part of the oleo strut sits very clearly at the end of the serverless retract. On the front landing gear I had to do some engineering and push back the retract by about eight mils as you can see in order that there was enough clearance for the wheel to come inside the housing. Here we can see the Oleo strut in better detail. This point here, that point there, that recess of the Oleo strut is going to sit at the very end of the retract and it's very important that it sits down in there. A serverless retract is quite a simple dumb piece of electronics. It goes up and down via a worm drive but if it detects any form of resistance, then at the end of the day, it will just stop. That is the only clever electronics in it. It will stop, as simple as that. That's a safety aspect uh, more than anything else. So um, it's very important that you pin, pin, that you millimeter perfect the size of your pin from the retract into the landing gear. And as I said, there, there's part of it there. You'll also note that there's no need for me to create a sleeve or to cover this. You can't see this outside of the landing gear. 
whereas clearly with the main gear, as you saw earlier on, you can. And so, so that I, so that we have got some form of sleeve, I've just used some nuts here. Again, you've got to be millimeter perfect. These are M3 nuts. I use three of them, and it ensures that that part of the oleo strut I've just pointed out on the nose gear again sits flush with the end of the retract. The main landing gear on the left and the right um, I didn't have to make any adjustments to. It fitted into the captive nuts fine. I did have to widen out the holes on the actual serverless retract by one millimeter but that's perfectly fine and that's in there rock solid. Those are now uh, lock tight in there. It's going nowhere. Every scale fuselage is different. Every build is different. I've used 0.6 millimeter spacers at the back here in order to raise the back of the retract so that the landing gear locks on the front of the edge in there without the wheel spinning. I didn't want the wheel spinning. I wanted it locked into place. Again, you've got to be millimeter perfect because if that was too far onto that edging there, the worm drive will simply stop um, and it will essentially not bind up. It won't, you know, you won't hear any creaking or anything, but it will essentially stop. So this is right at the very limit that the serverless retract will accept before the worm drive stops. Finally, the edging that I've used there is as a result of my own mistakes from all the different videos that I've done, all the different attempts that I've done with different size landing gears. And my area here will be significantly bigger than your area and it looked untidy and so on and I really wanted to make sure that they were both the same either side so I had to be brave with the Dremel get it out cut some stuff out and I've used this uh, car trimming that you use for edge trimming uh, which is perfect because you can cut it wherever you like it's got metal clips inside and it clips nicely onto there I've secured that I mean it's secured anyway but with a bit of medium super glue on the joining parts here they've joined because i've got framework in the way on the medium parts here and just wiped it with my finger so that it uh, created that that link there but i'm very happy with that so there we go landing gear the other thing about the wheels guys is that i wanted to make sure that the wheels apart from it being an oleo strut with the knee shape there that the spar was either side of the wheel for all three Whereas usually the wheel sets that you'll get, you might be lucky enough to get a spar on the front landing gear, but usually on the main landing gear, it will just be on one side. And so um, it, it was important to me that at least the landing gear not only looked semi-scale, but looked right. And on the Bell 222, it looks right, because it is right, <laughs> uh, that the spar is either side. So that's why I was quite picky when it came to the landing gear. Right, let's turn her back over and let's have a very quick run through on the other things that I've done before we sum up. Now, believe it or not, that is total, absolute, abject chaos. In there. One thing you've got to understand and accept from the word go that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. You waste a lot of people up there with your fucked up fire mission. That means no matter how good your plan is, when it comes to building it, you've got to be flexible and adaptable to change. And I had to do that several times on this build. I won't go the inter in through the intimacies um, of the cabling and so on. It's pretty obvious and you've, there is a cabling video up there where I explain what I was doing. But essentially, I'm very happy with how, we things, how we've got things now. The ESC mounted, I'm very happy with where that is. I did, by the way, change the fan so that was level. You'll note that I've only got one battery in here at the minute, but it fits two batteries very nice and neatly either side with the Velcro here. This Velcro is very high bonding Velcro. The batteries aren't going anywhere and in scale flight, there's absolutely no need providing you're using decent Velcro, decent hook and loop tape. There's no need for you to strap them down. I've put two batteries in here, turned this helicopter upside down, put it above my head and shook it violently for a minute and nothing came out and these batteries didn't move. So you know what, that's good enough for me. The glass is now in and there should be some pictures up now which shows you how I've done that. Um, and when I do a summary video, I'll cover that in more detail. I've also tactically put some holes, which I'm gonna mark up with some stickers and decals, 
which masks the fact that they're holes on purpose, which actually means that I can fit the boom with the main frame in place. Um, I haven't got to remove the main frame. I can simply put my two and a half inch drive, 2.5 mil drive through these holes and they fit the nuts on the other side perfectly. This means that, you know, when I'm maintaining Bella, I can put the mechanics in, I can bolt her in, line her up and she's in. She hasn't got to move again. I haven't got to mess around with the with the tail of the torque tube, which you'll see is absent from her at the minute. She's got a new one coming and I'm expecting that tomorrow. There were other things that I, ha that I also have done. I've created some side, you can see here, this uh, piece of aluminium here comes out of the frame, hooks onto the, uh, ties into the frame, comes underneath the main top part of the, uh, of the fuselage here. And underneath there, I've got a captive bolt that I've epoxied in and I'm able to bolt this down. This means that, you know, in, when, when Bella is taken off, she is taking off and taking the fuselage with her via several points. Firstly, these two side points ensure that the fuselage is lifted correctly and where Bella moves left and right, the fuselage moves with her and she's bolted in well over the top underneath. Glass was easy to put in. Um, in hindsight, now I've done it, I wouldn't have used hot glue on the inside. I would have used super glue, which uh, is recommended but I used hot glue. The bottom line is, can you see it? No, it's only actually until you get into sort of there where you see the sort of hot glue. And if you're not very good at hot gluing like I'm not, then it can look a bit of a mess. But one thing I have um, become better at is hot gluing. I can tell you that, um, where I used to just splurt it everywhere. Now, um, you know, I'm like a fine artist with it. Um, although you wouldn't notice. I'm very happy with the cabling inside. I'm happy with how neat it is. I'm very content with um, taking Bella in and out and servicing her. I did have to make some additional adjustments to the uh, doghouse so that the swash cleared and the arms cleared, etc. But I'm very happy with that is now. I'm going to be using sab edging around here so that uh, it looks nice and neat, etc. And as I said in a previous video, I moved the navigation light to the back here. I've got to do the torque tube and fit that in. I've got to put the head back on and sort that out. I've got some stickers coming. I'm going to plaster that all over her. Oh, and of course I fitted a new light at the bottom here, a spotlight, which I think looks very well. It's from a radio control car, not very powerful, powerful enough for me to see in the sky and I can angle it, etc. if I wanted to be all scale about it but I'm very happy with uh, how that looks and how that works. So this is worthy of a video on its own, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna summarize very simply by saying the windscreen comes in two parts. I've created a single part by epoxying a carbon strip down the middle there. And as you can see, I've used a, a, um, a little um, uh, servo, carbon bracket servo bracket there which I've epoxied in place and that has a nice little handle and it doesn't look that far off I mean it looks in place you don't know what you're looking at um, but that's a nice little handle for me to lift up and down this means that then the windscreen is one piece of glass which enables me as you can see here to create my own captive system which basically slides these little arms over the windscreen and ensures that the windscreen isn't going to go anywhere. And this means that I can access the front of my helicopter, the front of Bella. I can access her um, and uh, mess around with the electronics, etc., and obviously fit batteries, change them out or whatever. Um, and this windscreen isn't gonna go anywhere. The sound module I fitted at the back, and you can see that the sound module is fitted against the, against the side of the fuselage there with both eight watt transducers mounted to this side via hot glue, mounted to the side of the fuselage at the back here. I think I spent about three hours, three hours continually going over the sound file and, and moving these transducers inside the body of the uh, helicopter to get the best sound effect. Transducers work on vibration, so they should be faced towards uh, the fuselage, not the other way around. Everyone does transducers the other way around. They look at transducers as speakers. They're not speakers. They produce vibration and the vibration 
then goes into the body of whatever it is it's touching and that becomes the speaker. So essentially, Bella's speaker is her whole fuselage. Now, in radio control helicopters, we don't like vibrations on this. This little thing doesn't like vibrations. Um, and in general terms, you know, helicopters and vibrations don't get on. And this is why I spent so much time as I did in mounting Bella on the foam, on the plywood, on foam. She is completely and utterly separate and separated from the fuselage. Even on the arms here, where the alloy arms come out, underneath there, there is some foam um, before the captive nut. And I've played the sound file over and over again, and there isn't any vibrations coming into to Bella. I could have that, that sound system on constantly and fly her, and she'd be fine. So I'm very happy with having solved that now. There we go, there's your update. The final update, I might add, before we give a summary of build for what has been an incredible journey. I've enjoyed every bit of it, and I'm so pleased um, that we are where we are. We're so close now, and in the next video, we will have completed the build. She will be ready for her test flights which she will have plenty of before her maiden public flight on the 14th of August, 2023. It's always difficult when you do update videos, especially if you were a bit of a waffler and a jibber jabberer like I am. Um, it's very difficult to, to get it all in in a decent time that people aren't gonna switch off for. But look, hopefully that's given you a taste and a flavor of the sort of progress that we've made, which as I said, has been significant. And she is pretty much finished now. In the next video, the final video, we will conclude with a summary of the build, some top tips, some tools that I just couldn't have done without, and uh, there is no way that you could do a scale fuselage without those tools. That will be it, but you will see her in all of her glory, with her lights, her sound. You will see her with blades, and she would have been mechanically refined and tuned, etc., and ready for her test flights, and I'm so looking forward to that. I've really enjoyed this build process. It's been a real labour of love. I hope this update has been of some use to you. And until the next update, from Bella, the girls and me at Helished, till the next time, take care, fly safe.